Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Brianna Winbush, and I work on our SA360 platform here at Google. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, author, poet, and artist Harold Green III. Harold is an ever-evolving and internationally admired artist. He's earned the prestigious Carl Sandburg Literary Award, was a featured artist at the Chicago Mayoral Inauguration, and has appeared on TEDx. He's created commission work in partnership with brands like Nike, Lululemon, and Jordan, and most recently celebrates the launch of his second poetry collection, Black Roses, a tribute to 40 influential Black women making history and reshaping culture. Without further ado, let's welcome Harold Green III. Hey, 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 Brianna, how you doing? Hey, Harold, welcome to Google Talks, and congratulations on the launch of Black Roses. Super excited to have Thank you today. Thank you so much. So, I'm so excited. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited to talk to you today. And I wanted to just jump right in. Um, the name of your book, Black Roses, was released this week. And wanted to know, how did you come up with that name? And how did you go about selecting the women that you wanted to write and feature? Well, I, um, I'm always trying to do something different and unique with my career and my platform. And um, I've had you know this particular floral florist uh theme going on for like maybe 11 years now uh so i wanted to build off of that and the way i wanted to do that is a couple of years ago i came up with the idea i'm going to honor black women and black men um, but, you know, since Black Rose is the one that first came out, that was the one, you know, that we're talking about right now. And the idea was building off that florist idea. How can I talk about these women in the way that they have bloomed in the way that they have enriched this world with their bloom? Um, and the first person I did was Rhapsody. And it was a video. Oh, we put it up. Rhapsody ended up seeing it reposted and sent me an emotional message and you know the ball just kept rolling from there i was super inspired from the way that she reached back uh to just keep the project going and from there it was you know more success ava duvernay saw hers allison felix saw hers tracy ellis Ross. you know all of these women uh with these large platforms and you know grandiose careers um Put these put these video olds up and let me know that nobody had ever done anything like that for them. They never received a gift like that before, you know. And that just let me know that I was on the right path and I was doing what I set out to do. And I mean, the the process of cutting it down and and creating that list of forty was uh, it was laborious. Um, and it was really, you know, thanks to my editor. I had a wonderful editor over there at Harper. Um, I, Cause I came in with a very lengthy list, you know, like cause I wanted to talk about everybody, you know, but I just think that what I will be able to do is write volumes, you know, because this work I think never stops because ne black women will never stop being excellent, you know, so I will always have subjects to talk about. Um, but we had that like, you know, long list and my editor, she wanted to make sure, you know, we went through a, a, a process, you know, like we kind of started with the Uber uh, known, you know, world renowned, you know, the Beyonce's and Oprah's and Rihanna's of the world. We was like, OK, they kind of get, you know, accolades just about every day. Let's, you know, chop that, you know, that particular tier down. And then we, you know, start going to like where people, there was duplicates in, in certain disciplines, kind of cut that down. And uh, from there, you know, I was allowed to kind of pick and choose. And it was just, it was a very laborious task, but I'm glad that we got to the 40 and I'm very, very proud of the 40 that we have. Absolutely. And I've read the book myself and it is a just phenomenal piece of work. It definitely, like you said, touches on some of those heavy hitters, but also some of those underdogs who are still impacting culture and impacting the way that Black women are seeing themselves and experiencing life. So I love that. Um, I know that you mentioned a little bit about Rhapsody and she actually did the foreword for the book. So I wanted to know how that collaboration uh, came to part. Yeah, man, I have a I have a good friend who is, you know, one of her videographers. So when she saw it, she automatically knew I must have been good people because of the connections. And 
from there, we just built a relationship. Like when she comes to Chicago and performs, I go to the show and I make sure I, you know, get backstage and talk to her. And uh, we talk here and there. And I just, you know, on a win was like, man, it would mean a lot to me if you did the forward, you know, for Black Roses. And man, I can't tell you how thankful I was when she said yes. You know, that was such, that was just such a big thing to me. Like, I, I think so highly of her. And um, the way that she writes, like, it made me excited and, and made me say, man, I can't wait to Rhapsody write her own book because, I mean, it was just such a beautiful forward. And it just set the book up in such a way that you knew it was going to be endearing. Yes, I, I love that. She is iconic for sure. So to have two icons together on one piece of work, it definitely was a specialty for sure. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the illustration. So I know Melissa Kobe, um, your illustrator, she showcases the women that you've written about in these books without faces. So it made me feel like these stories and these poems could be about me. It was a reflection of my mom and my grandmother and other Black influential women in my life. And I wanted to know what was the idea behind these faceless uh, women? Man, I, I appreciate that question. I mean, and you know, and even before we get to that, I was just very, every piece of this book is intentional, you know, even down to the book designer. You know, when I came into the conversation with Harper, I said, look, this is what I would like to see happen for my book. I want to have a black woman book designer. I want to have a black woman illustrator. You know, I want my team, you know, across the board, I want it to be touched by black women and I want that to be felt. And I was lucky enough to be able to have, you know, what I requested. I had a wonderful black woman book designer, uh, Janae Michelle. And then uh, Melissa Kobe was actually the top of our list for illustrators and we got her. And I was so excited about that because she's I mean her work is phenomenal if you you know if you you know see her work online and stuff like that it's just a it's just a beautiful collection and I knew I loved her style of faceless portraits because it was what I was trying to get across with the words even though they are specific they are also universal and like you said you as a black woman reading this collection, you could see yourself and your loved ones in this book. And that's what I wanted to happen, you know, and not just for black women. I wanted everybody who touched this book to read, to read this book. I wanted them to be able to see all black women in these words, you know, and not just the specific people that were being talked about. And I knew that Melissa's work could accompany that with the illustration. So what I was trying to do in the literary sense, I knew she could do in the artistic sense. And I think it came together great. Like when you see these illustrations, you see that that's Janelle Monet, but you also see your cousin, your sister, or your friend from grade school, you know? And I think that's the beautiful part. I wanted the collection to be a, a, a reflection. And I think that's what we were able to accomplish with the words and the art. I love that reflection piece of it. I think it's so important that we kind of see ourselves in the art that we kind of exhibit every single day. So I love that you had that top of mind when you created it. Um, I see that you have your florist shirt on today. So I have yeah. to ask <laughs> about your flowers for the living. I know it's a music collective that you're the founder of. I wanted to know how did you decide to incorporate music and, and flowers and poetry and performing into who you are as an artist? So, um, you know, about 11 years or so ago, I started a online YouTube series called Flowers for the Living. And like I said before, I'm always trying to do something unique and something to make me stand out as an artist. And I figured, you know, something that I could do that I didn't see done was um, a series of spoken word videos. So I wanted to go from February 1st through the 14th. Uh, because February is important to me. It's Black History Month and it's my birthday month. So I was like, look, let me do something to kind of, you know, celebrate that month. And it started out as a series of spoken word uh, videos. But then that next year, my wife, who has been performing with me since college, mm -hmm. she came in and uh, we had a pianist uh, join us and we started doing love song covers. And then I would add my custom unique um poetry to it and then once she got pregnant with our second son about 2014 or so 
we had to switch gears and I had to call on like my super friends that I had collected over the years as a, a open mic host, you know, for the city. Um, I, you know, had all these musicians and other singers that I had on deck. So the band got bigger, the singers mm -hmm. roster got longer. And now we have like nine musicians, three background singers, like eight, uh, lead singer so this is about 20 of us you know and mm -hmm. it's a large collective obviously and we also have, also have a non-for-profit i go around doing different work and stuff like that and you know the merch line and stuff so it's just to me it was a it was a no-brainer you know i think that i'm i'm a big fan of flowers and i know how beautiful the metaphor of flowers is to life you know even when you think about not only the blooming and the work that it takes to garden and all of that but even cross-pollination you know when you think about you know how bees go from one to another and it creates these different hybrids and all of this beautiful stuff that kind of goes into the floral theme and the metaphor it has for life i thought it was beautiful for me to you know take that on as an artist and make that my brand because I think what I'm doing with my work and the way that I collaborate, you know, and cross pollinate with so many different people, so many different brands, I think that it makes me a, a, a world class florist, you know, and I think that we're all florists, you know, I think if we pay attention to the way that we deal with each other, the way that we garden, the way that we grow, I think that we are better off as as a humankind. I love that. I think if there's one thing I can take away from that is we are all human florists and she definitely yeah, absolutely. embraced that. I love that. Um, you talk a lot about collaboration and the collective and, and a whole, and I want to talk a little bit about Chicago. I think for people that are necessarily not from our city, they don't know that Chicago is known for being a black creative hub. And I wanted to know how have you been able to carve out your own lane and also remain true to yourself? Well, I knew very early, um, you know, I started in a spoken word scene probably around like 20, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about, so I started like 2004 in the spoken word scene. And um, I knew then how important it was to collaborate and just to mix talents because I, I saw it, I saw when, when styles got mixed and uh, when different artists would come together, how much more powerful it was, how much more powerful the performance would be. And I used to be a part of a, a spoken word collective called Verbal Balance. We had all kind of different spoken word artists, all different styles. And we would write pieces together. We would perform together. We would do different things together. And it was just like, you were dynamic by yourself, but when you came together, ooh, man, it was, you know, and I think too, like my, my sports background helped me see how important teamwork was, you know, like if you're a quarterback, it really don't make no difference how good you are if you don't have a receiver, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that knowing that having a great team around you or people that can help you get to the, you know, end product, um, I think that helped me see collaboration in a different way. And I also understand that collaboration brings in new audience. You know, you could be speaking out into the silo if you steady talking to your own crowd forever. But if you reach out across the board and, you know, bring other people in and allow people to, you know, do their thing, uh, it makes for a broader audience as well. And I think it's I think it's important in collaboration to allow people to shine and not, you know, say this is the idea and this is how I want to see it happen. You can say like, yo, this is the idea, like now let's just get to the to the end product and allow mm -hmm. people to, you know, pick and plot and, and, and do what they do along the puzzle. I love that for sure. And I think going off of that ability to shine, I think another area that you shine in is fatherhood. Um, you talk a lot about raising young black men yourselves. I know you have two sons. I want to know how that impacts the type of work you do and the things that you write about. Oh, uh, yeah, it has a huge impact. Um, my kids, you know, anybody that knows me, you know, or, or even just vaguely knows me, knows how important, you know, they are to me. And, um, like, you know, I had the opportunity in 2014 to speak at the mayoral inauguration here in Chicago, and I got to do a, a piece about my kids, you know, about being a father and how important that is to me. And I think 
you know, all of this is for them. You know, mm-hmm. I get the chance to create a legacy and that is through them and through my art, you know? And, you know, I have a, a tattoo um, on my on my arm, on my forearm, it's a lion and then two cubs. And then in Latin, it says, bis vive, que bene vive. And it means he who lives well lives twice. And it's important to me that I do this thing the right way so that they can carry on, you know, and, and do it even better the next time around. And then that way, you know, that legacy just kind of keeps on going. And if they seeing their father, you know, carry on in a certain way, then they have to carry themselves in a certain way to a certain degree, you know, just mm-hmm. off of proximity. And it used to be for me before I had kids that my poetry was a rule book for me. You know, if I'm writing, you know, in a certain way or talking about certain things, then I have to live in that way. And and once I knew I was going to have children, I put their names in all in the back of all my books because now it's a rule book for them. You know, if they hear this stuff and they see me living a certain way, then that kind of rubs off on them through osmosis. Absolutely. And I think that's so important, especially in our culture and Black fatherhood and Black manhood is such a huge thing that we need to just continue to invest in and foster love in. And I know that you're coming out with a new book titled Black Oaks, and this is for the Black men. So I want to know what can we expect from this collection of poems? Black Oak is uh, the male companion to Black Roses. And, you know, to me, what I'm trying to do with Black Roses and Black Oak, I think the role of the poet is to put form to sentiment. So we as human beings have all these feelings and we have all these experiences. And I think any great poet has the ability to take those feelings and that sentiment and put form to it so that when you want to think back to it or you want to live in that moment again, you have that that journalism of sentiment right there at your fingertips, you know? And I think, you know, with, with Black Roses, I feel like I'm trying to create emotional equity for Black women. I think for centuries, they have just been derided, pushed to the back, you know, taken from the things that, you know, they have been ridiculed or ostracized for. They have to look up and then people are capitalizing off of them, you know? And I think, you know, it's just been, a twofold of disrespect, being black and being woman, you know, and I think that what I'm trying to do is create a new language for people to use when we're talking about black women, because sometimes we can have the, all the admiration that we want, but we don't know how to express ourselves. So I'm mm-hmm. trying to create form to that sentiment. And with Black Oak, I'm trying to create form to sentiment of how brothers how we speak to each other right since i'm a black man writing writing these love letters to other black men i want to i want to change the narrative of how we talk you know we have such a cryptic respect for each other you know we shake up and head nods and all this Mm -hmm. cool slang that we use but i want us to be able to be more direct look each other in the eyes and tell each other i love you I appreciate you. I admire you. You inspire me. You motivate me, man. Keep going. Even if things is getting hard, you're doing your best. Mm -hmm. And that's all I expect. You know what I'm saying? It's like so many things that we don't necessarily get to hear because we don't necessarily put it out there ourselves, you know? And I think women do Mm -hmm. such a great job of, of doing that for each other. And I want us to do a great job of doing that for each other as well, because it doesn't make any sense to die tough, to die a Mm -hmm. rock. You know what I'm saying? I think that we can learn a lot from the water. The water knows that if it's malleable and flexible, it can get to so many more places. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's a really good lesson for the entire culture to learn and to embrace. So thank you for kind of taking that on as as your role. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the younger Harold Green. So the old you, what advice (laughs) would you give your younger self um, if you could today? You know, I think honestly, um one of the things i would probably tell the younger me is it's gonna work you know um i i didn't have i didn't have a moment of like i want to give up um or like i want to change course i always believed that this was going to be what i was supposed to do once i started i i was very adamant and very like headstrong on like, man, you are cold, bro. You like, you should, this is what you should be doing. 
Um, but there are moments that get tough. You know, there's moments that you sent out a thousand emails and nobody responds that you're like, uh, come on world. You know, mm -hmm. like I remember a time when I was at an open mic and I felt like, you know, I didn't get the response that I wanted or whatever the case was. It was just, you know, just being emotional and came home and I was performing in my basement of my parents' house at the top of my lungs, crying and, and they thought somebody was trying to attack me, you know what I'm saying? And like my dad hugged me and I was just telling them like, man, I just, I just want to be heard, you know? And to look up now and to know that I'm being heard, even with it's with it's still having its own, you know, struggles and hurdles and all of that good stuff, it just feels so good to know that staying the course paid off, you know? And I think just having that reassurance when I was younger, because there was times when it was hard and it was like, you know, when you leave in the studio at three o'clock in the morning, got to wake up at six o'clock in the morning where you just like, man, please let this all work out, you know, and please let it work out the way that I envision it, you know? Um, it's good. It would have been good to have older heroes sitting in the passenger seat of that car like, hey, it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly hear you. We see you and we thank you for your contribution. Um, still on the subject of, you know, that younger, your Harold, can you explain and give us a little glimpse into the first poem you ever wrote? Yeah, I, um, the first one, I think, I believe, so I know it was senior year and I was working at finish line. Um, mm -hmm. and I probably shouldn't have been working at finish line because every check I got went right back to the store. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, when it came to Christmas, you know, my money was gone because it was all in my closet. And I was like, man, what am I going to do? So I wrote my mother, my father, my sister poems for Christmas. And I mean, the results were, they were beautiful. They were crying. And my sister telling me like, Harold, you should really, you know, keep going with this. And this is like, you know, this is like for real good. Not like you playing around good. Mm -hmm. And I knew in that moment that I had came across something special because before that I was kind of messing around with it and, you know, doing little stuff. Cause I used to, you know, I used to write raps and all that and be in little groups and all that. So I knew I could write, but I, you know, would be playing around after watching Death Poetry Jam and stuff. But this is when I took it seriously. And then right after that, since that was December, I know like in January, uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, she, um, we had an anniversary and I had got us a little limo ride and uh, to the restaurant and I wrote her two poems. So I wrote a one to reader on the way there and one to read on the way back. So my poetry has always been a gift. You know, I've always used my gift as a gift. So like the way I'm using it now is no different from the way I, you know, came in. I love that. So you acknowledge it was a, a gift in the past and you invested in yourself and kind of look where you are today. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you could give any words of wisdom to the next generation of, of Black poets and authors and, and artists, uh, what would that be? I think, you know, I think it's always, for me, I think it's always, you know, speak from your heart. You know, I think that's, I think that's a really important Especially when we're in a day and time of, you know, the digital age and it gets so pressing to impress, you know, and to get impressions, um, you know, as a, as a creative, every day we have to deal with the fact that if you don't have a million followers, you might not be the one to get the call you know, mm -hmm. or if you don't have X amount of followers, you know, what they gonna pay you is very minimal, you know what I'm saying? And there's all these things that we have to deal with and kind of work through in our mind. And I think as we go further into this digital age, I, I really want the artisans that will be coming, you know, up after me and, and beyond to just kind of keep in mind how important staying true to your heart is, you know, and not trying to, reach out for the likes or the viralness, you know, to, to really speak to what is true to you. And that is the stuff that I feel like will last for eons, you know, not, not that flash mm -hmm. in the pan. This was, you know, of the moment, but like what was really on your heart, what was able to make you, cause what they can never, you know, what technology can never take from us 
what makes us human beings is sentiment. You know, they can build as many robots as they want to, but that human sentiment is something that, you know, you can never, you can never take away from us. You know, even if you, you know, get get the algorithm just right or, you know, mm-hmm. get, the, get the program just right, it's that human sentiment, that heart to heart that you cannot, you can't fake that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that people, people understand it. That's why when you read the book that you cried, you know, that's why when mm-hmm. these women got these poems, why they reacted the way they reacted and cried and all that stuff, because human sentiment is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that transparency and vulnerability is something that can't be, you know, replicated. So I definitely agree. So going back to the book, um, I know for a fact that some of these poems have actually made their way in the hands of some of the women that you actually have written about. Um, And I know on Instagram, your goal actually is to make sure that each rose gets a box and they receive their poem. And how can how has that made you feel like just knowing that there has been such tremendous impact from your work and from your words? Uh, it makes me emotional. Um, you know, like, like I said, when I first started the project and these roses started seeing their books, seeing their poems and the way that they were reacting, cause it wasn't just like, they was just like hardening it and then saying thanks. Like they were, you know, like reposting it and sending me like, you know, private messages about how much it meant to them and how much it touched them. And I remember specifically, uh, Ava DuVernay, when she reposted hers, because I just, you know, a lot of these is just like, you know how we talk about the six degrees of separation and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Some of these is just like, I, I don't know anybody that knows them. I don't have any kind of expectations. Just like, we're going to put this out here and, you know, hope for the best. So like when they actually see them and respond and react, it's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, I remember I was in the gym working out and Ava DuVernay had reposted and like I had to stop my workout and like mm-hmm. I had to like call my sister because I was emotional you know and I was like my eyes was watering and stuff mm-hmm. and it was just it, it meant so much to me for her to feel like yo I've never received anything like this you gotta think about a woman who you know was out here winning Oscars and making mm-hmm. you know these billion dollar movies and all of this stuff and it's like wow, this is something that stood out to you, you know? And then I remember the morning that Tracy Ellis Ross saw hers and I was making breakfast and Dwayne Wade had just posted his his old from Black Oak and she put mm-hmm. it in her story. And I was like, oh, well, if you think that's something like, you know, I wrote something for you and I mm-hmm. showed her and she put it up and I was just, and I had to stop cooking breakfast. And I was crying, man, because I was, one, D-Wade did his and then she did hers right after that. And it was just like, this is a lot, you know, like mm-hmm. I was just like, this is a lot for my heart right now, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do anything but just let the emotion out because um, it's not about the proximity to celebrity. It's about how your work is affecting people and Mm -hmm. you having the vision that it would do such a thing and for that vision coming to life, you know? So now with books, you know, being a real thing, you know, I had a vision of how I wanted them to be presented and how I wanted them to reach them. And, you know, I wanted the books to be in there with, you know, a, a eternal black rose and I wanted the boxes to be black and, you know, all this stuff that I presented mm-hmm. to the publishing house and it came true. And they, you know, they, they worked really hard to make what I wanted to be a reality, a reality. And it meant so much to me. So to see these black roses getting these boxes and, you know, being, you know, so happy about them, you know, like Eve Ewing has put hers up and Tarana Burke, mm-hmm. the founder of the Me Too movement, put hers up. And uh, we also had uh, Janice Jackson put hers up, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's just been miraculous, man, to see, to have vision and then to have vision turn into reality is mm-hmm. just, you know, is just remarkable. And no matter how many times it happens to me, I will never be like just not in awe, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that you said that vision piece. You started off with that that vision and then you put in the work to watch that vision come to pass. Um, And going off of that, I would love to know about some of those sacrifices that you made, that perseverance that you had to have to kind of see this thing fully come into play. Can you talk a little bit about that? I couldn't even begin to tell you, you know, like, I left school because I believed in this so much, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, like my junior year of college, I had 
I had started getting uh, flown out and, you know, getting paid for gigs and stuff. So I was like, oh, I'm a professional now. You know what I'm saying? And like, I really like from that moment on, just never turned back. And Mm -hmm. um, just even after having kids and getting married and all that stuff, I just did whatever I had to do. You know, I had a full time job in CPS, but I was also still a full time artist, you know, and a full time Mm -hmm. father, full time husband. And like I said, it would be nights. I would be leaving the studio or leaving the gig three in the morning, whatever the case may be. Got to get up at six and do it all over again. And I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it, you know, like because it allowed me to see these dreams through, you know, and uh, Mm -hmm. it's people who will, (laughs) you know, even still who are just not as familiar with how things work or whatever the case may be if they ask like, what do I do? And I tell them I'm a poet and it's like, you know, they almost get scared. Like, uh, okay, how you make a living doing that? And I was like, oh man, <laughs> I probably make a better living than you. No worries. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's all from sacrifice. You know, like I, I worked really, really, really hard. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, even when we're talking about the flowers for the living, uh, collective, I mean, I've been doing that for like 11, 12 years, whatever the case may be. And that's, you know, from February 1st through the 14th, that's 14 different poems every year for 11 years, you know what I'm saying? And not to add all the different shows that we do throughout the year and, you know, different stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's just that, you know, I've just been very prolific in this particular genre and I've just never stopped. And it's allowed me a place that I'm, you know, sitting in right now and I, I just, I, I don't regret any of the sacrifices at all. And so it sounds like staying steadfast really paid off, which I think we all need to hear. Did. Absolutely. Like, yeah, the consistency and determination um, and the loyalty to the vision absolutely mm-hmm. paid off. Love it. Love to see it. If you could collaborate with anyone, um, who would it be and why? Man. I love so many people. Like mm. I'm one of I'm you know, I think some people, some artists are like um silo artists where like they can't listen to nothing else or hear nothing else while they create or you know, whatever the case may be, because they have to, you know, just I'm one of the people I am uh uh an artist, I'm a fan artist, you know what I'm saying? Like I just love mm people who are doing great things and um always mixing up so my line my my list of like dream collaborations is really long you know mm-hmm. um i was asked the other day like who who could i see myself being in the verses uh with and i thought that was a really like creative and interesting question mm-hmm. and it it reminded me of this question because it made me think about my answer is 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 rather unique and rather like kind of like unorthodox because this couldn't happen because the person is dead. But mm-hmm. Gil Scott Heron is somebody that I really admire and really look up to and really wish like my career could be as half as like impactful as he is was. You know, that's somebody that I think about a lot uh, because I just love the way that he incorporated music and poetry and you know just still was so of the culture you know what i'm saying um mm-hmm. so i know i know it kind of slightly veered off off your question but that's somebody that i think about a lot though i love it i love that super iconic one other question i have about the book um is that in a lot of the different poems you use the term young gifted and black it's something that you say continuously <laughs> so i wanted to know like what does that statement mean to you what does it mean to the culture and why did you feel necessary to include it um in your piece of work and you know it, it's so funny that you brought that up because we worked very doggedly on making sure that things weren't repeated unnecessarily um but that was a a phrase that I wanted to keep in in you know multiple poems. Uh, so I'm, I'm I am glad that that was picked up on. Um, I've just I've always thought that that phrase was it was it seems very like innocent and very like unassuming, but it's a very powerful phrase. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like because when you when you think about the way 
one, when you think about the history of black education in America and the way that literacy was outlawed for a long mm -hmm. time, you know, and to be able to put those words on a black person, let alone a black child or a black or a young black individual, that's a radical statement, you know, mm -hmm. to be young, gifted and black, you know, because there was a time in this space where we, we could not be that at all or could not refer to ourselves like that at all you know we weren't mm -hmm. even allowed to is actually literally against the law so when i think about that phrase and i think about how far we've come and how many young gifted and black people we have in america and how mm -hmm. they get to live out loud in color it's just it's a, it's a radical phrase and it's a it's a beautiful phrase to me that i think you know should be echoed for mm -hmm. centuries because i never want us to forget that you know i never want us to forget how gifted we are i never want us to forget how proud we should be you know mm -hmm. and that and that young piece that's you know that's that's timeless you know we we only mm -hmm. as, as young as we feel you know what i'm saying and i think that we are all always learning which keeps us young you know so i, mm -hmm. I just think it applies to all of us and i think that we should never lose that magic of being young gifted and black I love that. I didn't even think of it as like we're always young, gifted and black. Yeah. It's a mindset. Yeah. If you if you keep your mind open, you're forever young. You know, we don't mm -hmm. know everything and never will. Mm hmm. So important. So my last question is, where is Harold Green in five years? What are you doing? What are you working on? Well, I, I actually, uh, man, very thankfully uh, have two children's book deals too so i have one with chronicle books out in oakland and then i have mm -hmm. uh another one with uh running press which is the imprint of hachette um so i have five children's books under contract that will be wow. you know rolling out over these next five years or so so uh Harold will probably be in somebody's children's bookstore doing a reading or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll probably be, you know, on Tabitha Brown's uh, YouTube channel uh, on her kids show, you know, yes. something, you know. So it, it's it's a lot of beautiful things I think that will be coming along in the next five years. And I think, uh, you know, I I got a whole like digital uh, little vision board that I keep adding to. Cause I have so many dreams and so many things that I, I want to achieve. You know what I'm saying? I want to, mm -hmm. I want to be on a New York times bestsellers list. I, I, mm -hmm. I want to be, I want to be a, a, a NAACP award recipient. You know, I want to be on Saturday night live. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be on Oprah's uh, book club. You know, it's just all these wonderful things that, um, uh, I just want to see happen. I was just telling, you know, you, you had asked me about the event that I just had here in Chicago the other day. And mm -hmm. I was telling the audience, like, you know, when we're talking about like, like confidence and, and, and all of that, and I was explaining how influential my family was and, and even more specifically, uh, because we were talking about black roses, I was talking about, you know, like my mom and my sister, mm -hmm. my wife, my cousin, the ones, you know, who are in the book and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was explaining how when people pour into you like that and they believe in you, it makes it so much, it almost gives you a superpower of, of belief, you know, because a lot of us, we, we kind of fail from a lack of belief in self, mm -hmm. you know, like we want to do something, but then we like, we doubt ourselves and we're, you know, not counting like, oh, well, I'm not going to go after that because, and I actually have like this like foolish belief in myself to the point where mm -hmm. I just believe I can do whatever, you know, because mm -hmm. I've been told and I've been poured into in that way. And I was explaining to them, you know, I don't know, I don't know time. See, that's not my, that's not my superpower. I don't, I'm not a psychic. I don't know the time that things are going to happen, but I believe that they will. And just as much as, you know, I'm sitting there talking to them in the promontory in, in Hyde Park in Chicago, I said, well, the next time you'll see me in a United Center. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And like, and that's the way that I see things. That's the way that I believe. And that's, that's the visions that I have. And I don't, I'm not a psychic. I don't know the timeline of things, but I just know the reality of things. And that's, you know, how I kind of move. I love it. Like manifestation and just Absolutely. really believing in what your capabilities are in your future. I love it. So we are entering um, the moment, and I'm super excited that you're actually going to read a couple of poems from Black Roses for us. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted you to give me your favorites so that we could have a, a, a rich dialogue, you know, because yes. you, you did me such the honor of even reading the book. So I wanted to make sure that I read a couple that meant something to you. And I know the first one that you told me was Eve's loyalty, the mm-hmm. ode to uh, Dr. Eve Ewing. So we're going to read that one first. Eve's loyalty. Have you ever seen someone love so hard that they learn everything they can about you just so they can remind you who you are, how you started and how far you have to go just so you never forget the mission? Have you ever seen someone love so hard that they talk about you so passionately, so vividly, so clear that it forces people to listen? Have you ever seen someone love so hard They continuously create the best version of themselves so they represent you well, no matter where they go. Have you ever seen someone love so hard that people see you in them no matter where they go? Have you ever seen someone love so hard that even when you break their heart, they still keep it open for you? Have you ever seen someone love so hard that even when you break their heart, they still won't let nobody say nothing bad about you. Have you ever seen someone love so hard that they write love letters about you and share them with the world? Well, that's how much Eve loves Chicago, a transformative love, a love that looks you in the eye and tells you, I know what you're made of, a love that doesn't let go. We can all learn from the way Dr. Ewing loves Chicago. I love that. I love that. And I, the reason why I really picked that, that poem is because of Chicago. I'm, I'm all things Chicago. It is <laughs> what raised us, what created us. Um, mm-hmm. What made you write this poem about Dr. Ewan? Because, man, you know, Eve is a, is a writer, a sociologist, an educator all these wonderful things but one thing she would never let you forget no matter you know how harvard she is or whatever the case may be is that she's from chicago you know Mm -hmm. and i think that's i think that's something that a lot of chicagoans can relate to you know no matter Mm -hmm. how big in stature you get no matter how many accolades you receive i mean even common you know no matter how many stages he didn't grace and all that he gonna let you know he from Chicago, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And I think that mm-hmm. that's a beautiful thing. Like when a place, because that says something about this place, because so many people try to push this negative narrative and this, this violent narrative. And of course we have mm-hmm. so many things we can make better and so many things we can work on, but there's something very beautiful about this place and very embracing and loving and endearing or else we wouldn't be so connected to it, you know? Mm-hmm. No matter who you are, you know, top to bottom, whatever the case may be, there's a connection that you have to this place that makes it special. And if you've ever been to Chicago in the summertime, then you you understand what I'm talking about. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? But I think it's beautiful the way that Eve does this because as a sociologist, she mm-hmm. sees the negative and the positive, the numbers, you know, because a lot of people can talk about, you know, this and that. But I mean, she's actually dealing with data you know like Mm -hmm. empirical stuff and that could be heartbreaking you know what i'm saying but she still keeps her her heart open for chicago Mm -hmm. and i think that we can all learn a lesson even a lesson in love like you know how Mm -hmm. we treat people you know people can let us down and and break our hearts but there's a certain amount of grace that has to be exuded when you say you love something and i think she Mm -hmm. exudes that grace in a very beautiful way Yes, I love how you you talk about love in this poem, but not in the romantic sense. But we still are romanticizing Chicago in this poem. So I really love it. Yeah. And Chicago is a romantic place, man. So I thought it was a I thought it was a beautiful way to kind of bring that all of those, you know, elements together. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Harold. And what about the next poem? The next one is uh Simone Biles, man. And I love this one that the the illustration for this one is like, oh man, it's I, I don't know. It's just something every time I see it, it just takes me a place. But 
Um, the name of this piece is uh, Simone's Wings, Ode to Simone Biles. You are so rebellious that you decided to defy gravity, ignore all the rules and fly. I've never seen a human being transform like you. You saw how uneven the bar was and decided to just raise it. You kept going until you found balance. You vaulted into our hearts and onto podiums with laser beam focus. Maybe it's because Miss Nelly showed you how to see your goals before you crushed them. And maybe it was Mr. Ron who taught you how to build wings. In turn, you have taught so many how to dream. You are so rebellious that you defied physics and became gold. You may be one of the best alchemists this world has ever known. So many of us live with the fear of the unknown, but you had the courage to soar, not knowing where you would land. But look at you, both feet firmly planted in history, pushing through pain with all that pressure piled atop your petite frame. What a degree of difficulty. And I know all of life's tumbles can take their toll, but you've shown us that coming up short doesn't have to alter long-term goals. You've shown us how to fly and that is gold. I love it. I gotta give you my snaps. <laughs> Incredible. So this poem definitely was just super encouraging and uplifting and just show so much love and respect for Simone and just every other Black woman who goes against the odds every single day. Um, what made you come up with this poem? And I specifically want to know about Miss Nellie and, and Mr. Ron. Man, so, you know, one of the beautiful things about writing this book is, you know, what I what I call getting to sit with each of these roses. And that was, you know, all the research, you know, I would do. I would, you know, watch all these interviews, read all these articles, listen to these podcasts, you know, just all kind of stuff, just go through all kind of archives just to get a better feel and understanding, even down to just minute things like not even what they're saying, but how they talk, how they mm -hmm. laugh, you know, what they smile at. Um, all of these things were very important to me and, and learning about uh, Simone's guardians was a special part of her story to me because mm -hmm. it it tried along her history people have tried to discredit her guardians you know and mm -hmm. her uh miss nelly was she has been the one who has been influential in making sure that simone had her own vision boards and 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 set out goals you know before each school year and before each you know gymnastic season and making sure that she checked those goals off and and mr ron was like a uh air force guy and that's what you know the wings thing kind of came from and maybe he was the one mm -hmm. who taught her you know like how to fly and all that you know mm -hmm. so i wanted to make sure that in composing these pieces, that through all the research that I was doing, I was also adding very unique and specific sentimental parts to these poems that made these women understand like, oh, he really took his time with this. Mm -hmm. He really, you know, dug for this, you know, while still making sure that it was like universal. And, and, it, and it makes you, in my opinion, it it makes you want to learn more about these women. Like, who is this person? Why is he mentioning this person? Why is this person's name mm -hmm. italicized or both? You know, and I and I wanted, you know, what I wanted to do was also make people look into these women a little bit more. Like we know, mm -hmm. you know, their stories, you know, on the surface and stuff like that. But when you learn more about them, they're even more miraculous, you know. And I think that that's very interesting. And I and I also believe, you know, Simone she took the the sport and created a bigger platform and mm -hmm. i think that's special because there's a lot of young girls out there who look up to her and there are a lot like you said there are so many black women who we can use gymnastics as a metaphor you know mm -hmm. so many tumbles so many falls you know mm -hmm. but you get back up you keep flipping you keep doing your your life gymnastics and mm -hmm. look at you, you go, you know, you are alchemists. You have turned so many just dirty, crummy situations into life's finest precious stones, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, as every other poem I created in this, 
work, I wanted that to be, you know, universal and a metaphor for life. Thank you so much, Harold. And, and these two are just snippets of the tremendous amount of just success that's within this piece of work, all of the greatness and glory that you are shining a light on amongst Black women and making it just a universal story. We just appreciate it and we honor it so much. So thank you for your contribution. No, thank you. And thank you for reading and thank you for having me and thank you for these wonderful conversations that we've had. Absolutely, absolutely, Harold. There's one more thing. Where if you want another copy of Black Roses, if you want to buy one for your mom, your daughter, your friend, you can purchase it anywhere books are sold, um, Amazon included. Absolutely, please buy all them books so we can go into our second <laughs> print, man. And I don't want to get on this New York Times bestseller so I can put that in my bio. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You got to get Harold to his next next level for sure. <laughs> It was so great to connect with you today, Harold. We are so excited for Black Roses and Black Oaks that are coming up in May. We wish you all of the success. Congratulations, and we hope to talk soon. Thank you so much, Brianna. All right, have a good one. You too.